Greetings, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the eighth in a series of webinars presented by the Light Brigade and hosted by Lightwave Online. I want to thank, thank Stephen Hardy and his team for hosting these. They've been very popular. Uh, today's topic is the FTTX Outside Plant Design Fundamentals. And today we have actually two presenters involved. We have David Stallworth and Larry Johnson. And Larry will give David a little bit of introduction in a minute. Uh, I want to go over some of the housekeeping rules first off. Uh, one of the questions we're always asked up front is, do you allow downloads? And no, we don't allow downloads of these slides. There's a lot of proprietary information that we use in our training classes, so we don't allow a download. But you can always go back to the Lightwave Online website and watch any of our webinars, including this one, uh, on demand. This one will be available in about 24 hours. Questions can be asked at a question box in the lower left corner of your screen. We will try and hold off on questions until the end in answering them. But as they come to you, please go ahead and list them here. If you have a technical question, those will be answered by our technical team immediately. Uh, but questions pertinent to the webinar itself will pick up at the end. If you have questions for either Larry or David during the presentation, go ahead and load them into this uh, question area. Uh, if we miss any of the questions uh, that would come up, we will always answer those by email at the end of the webinar. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Larry. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us again. Uh, a little bit about the Light Brigade. Uh, you can see on the slide our founding date and how many uh, attendees we've uh, trained over the years. And uh, it's been a lot of fun, especially on the fiber to the home uh, uh, technology. We uh, actually were involved with one of the first conferences back in 1989 uh, when the field trials were first reviewed. Um, so we've always prided ourselves on our, our strengths in that. And one of the staff that you're going to uh, be listening to today is uh, David Stallworth. Uh, David is a uh, outside plant specialist. Uh, he's been involved with uh, the outside plant for 45 years. Uh, much of this specifically with fiber optics, uh, also included uh, projects with hybrid fiber coax networks and fiber to the X uh, system design and uh, project consulting. Um, we'd like to just go over a little history here of how this uh, particular subject came up. Um, first thing is we have a series of about four courses. One's a certified fiber to the home professional, which is uh, certifications through the fiber to the home council. Uh, we also have an online version of the CFHP for those that are international and can't attend courses here in North America. Of course, we present courses, uh, custom courses internationally as well. Matter of fact, we're in Malaysia this week in Singapore. Um, but the FTTX Outside Plant Design course uh, filled a niche that we felt needed to address uh, after the initial planning and design to go and cover the topics on how do you develop a plan, how do you initiate it. And then our last course, not mentioned, uh, what we're going to talk about next month on our webinar is uh, Fiber to the X for the installers and technicians, talking specifically about testing and troubleshooting these type systems. So at this point, I'd like to turn the, turn the microphone over to uh, David Stallworth, who's going to present the body of the course. And we'll join you later at the end with the question and answers. OK, David? Well, hello, everyone. And I hope uh, that you find this will, uh, will be of help to you. There's two general topics I'd like to talk about today. One involves the economical location of network elements in the field. And the second involves determining the design strategy to use. These are two very important topics that really have to be decided before an engineer puts paper to pencil. So we'll take a look at that. And, uh, and the way we view engineers, the way I look at engineers, is different than a designer. An engineer should be able to get their hands around all the design strategies that are available, can economically justify every mark that's on the drawing, designs operationally sound systems, and design systems that are upgradable in the future. If we can accomplish those things uh, with an engineering design strategy, then we're, uh, we're, in, we're in good shape, good to go. Well, when we look at uh, fiber to the home network, there's a lot of costs that we need to consider. Uh, all the individual piece parts of a network um, are shown here. And, but there are relationships between these costs that we really need to understand. 
in order to make a, the most economical, uh, sound decision for our, for our design strategies. But there's other factors that we need to consider as well. You will find, and, and in our course, we talk about it in great length, that the, the take rate, the customer take rate that you as a service provider will encounter has a very significant impact on fiber to the home design. The geography you have to deal with uh, naturally is, is uh, whether it's, it's downtown or a rural area, that plays a big part of it. The labor rate also plays a big part of it, your specific labor rate. So these three what I call customer dynamics help drive this decision of how to design the fiber to the ne uh, home network economically. This next slide, you see there's a lot of different relationships I've got listed here. From head in electronics, you can see take rate effects, the location of the optical splitter. Uh, from an economic standpoint, we have to consider the construction labor, the installation labor. It's one thing to design a network economically, but a good engineer is going to make sure that, that it operationally is sound as well. So we need to have some kind of help in understanding these relationships so that we can make the right decision. And that's what uh, we do in our course uh, as, as well. But an engineer really needs to make, make uh, good decisions based on this. Well, when you look at fiber to the home, there's four general design options that are available. Um, the one in the upper left is active Ethernet, uh, and that's separate from the other three, which are PON passive optical networks. Those three are... Uh, we uh, involve placing an optical splitter. The active Ethernet does not have a splitter. And there's a difference between the two. And in a lot of uh, seminars and conferences I've been into, I get a lot of questions about which one of these two technologies should I deploy. Well, both technologies have the same capability to deliver all the services. When we look at single family, uh, single residential family or small businesses, they can both do the same. So it makes sense to use both technologies instead of one or the other. Let's do the smart thing, take advantage of both technologies, and use them where they make sense. So uh, we would recommend the blending of these technologies and into a fundamental plan for an area. You may have a, a town that looks something similar to this, but bigger or smaller doesn't make any difference, but you should have a fundamental plan developed on how you're going to serve every unit in that town. That fundamental plan can in involve both the design for active Ethernet and PON. We get into that in depth in our, in our course more. But to plant the seeds, take a look at, at serving. You may, wanna, you may have uh, uh, data users, uh, high-end users like the data centers or hospitals or government, military, that requires uh, an active Ethernet, a dedicated bandwidth with maybe even diversity as well. That's where an active Ethernet plays, uh, plays benefits. But when you're talking about the mom-and-pop businesses, the single-family residential, the PON technology is uh, uh, the more economical technology to deploy for that, at least in the phase cost benefits. Well, moving on, let's say if you were going to place fiber uh, to uh, every business and residence in this, uh, in this town, what would you do? How would you go about doing it? Or if you were going to place uh, fiber uh, in the home, uh, to the home, to, to, this, uh, to this development. There's a lot of questions you need to ask before you get started. First, where should the head-end hub or node, uh, I'll use those interchangeably, but they're meaning the same thing, where should that be placed in this general region, in this area? How many feeder routes would I take out of that hub or node? Where should the feeder routes be placed? In, in what configuration is, and how do I arrange the branch feeder routes? Where are the boundaries? How, how, is there an economical configuration that I should try to, to match when I'm looking at this? Or where the, should the splitters be placed? All these are very critical questions that must be answered before we start engineering. What's the strategy going to be? And one of the most uh, effective ways that has been developed over the years to, the, to take a look and studying outside plant network is called an idealized planning method. Let's say if we were going to look at this town, um, we would break it up into what's called an ideal planning areas. Each square has 32 homes. Say it starts out with 500 feet by 500 feet. Uh, that can c control the density when you work up a, a, a cost model. You can change that to change the densities. And so you can take a look at that, 
that uh, uh, set that up as the ideal area. And if we can come up with an ideal solution for that ideal area and then tweak it for reality, then we have a, a really, that's the best way to attack this uh, outside plant network in a cost-effective manner. So in, if you were looking at where a uh, node was going to be placed in this ideal area, you can see there's a number of different places it could go. So there's a number of different ways you can place this. So we need to study all of these places and see what the most economical uh, configuration would be for this ideal area. And you would come up with a chart that looks something like this. You would plot each point, one, two, three, four, and you would come up with a plot for each one of them. You can develop that into costs and elements. And what you find out that there is a there is an economical location for the nodes based on 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 the ideal planning area. So once you know that, then this chart also tells you something very significant. The more you you uh, uh, vary from that ideal location, the higher the costs become. Now that's important to think about because in the real world. Chances are you're not going to get the ideal spot in, in an area just because reality won't let you do that. But when you understand that the further you move away from it, the higher your cost is going to be, that's, that plays in, into, uh, into, into the mix. Well, when we look at feeder routes, um, the same type of question. Once I determine a node, where would I feed, how many feeder routes do I take out of that node, and is there an economical configuration for these feeder routes? Where should they be placed? What about the boundaries, the branch feeder routes? Is there a method of placing branch feeder routes that's more consistent, more economical over the long term than other places? And there is. Uh, we go back to our ideal network, and we look at, you can see there's a number of different ways to configure outside plant networks. Which one is the most economical? Which one should I try to replicate in all instances? We go through that in our course in detail, and and, uh, and there's a lot of factors that determine that, and uh, we can make some general conclusions based on all the studies that's been going on uh, that has gone on in the last 30 or 40 years. And then you would come up interestingly with the same type of chart um, as you had in the node that the, the more you vary from that ideal, the higher the costs become. So it's important that we study this and, and understand this as engineers as we try to drive the cost and, and develop the most economical uh, network from a design standpoint. Also, uh, there's a thing called future proofing. Um, these next uh, several slides, I will be just covering various topics to, to talk about or to think about is in, in developing this, this uh, fundamental planning. Um, we want to provide for and get our we need to get our hands around all the services that we want to provide in this network, including cellular cameras, rings, all kind of configurations. Um, and we want to size these cables for any uh, unknowns. There's a, a method that you can go through when you look at vacant land to determine um, the type of uh, uh, get an estimate of the number of of facilities you would need for vacant land even, and, and, and working and understanding the zoning, uh, in, at least in the United States, understanding the, how a land is zoned, what its future plan is, is very important. So there's ways you can go through, uh, and good engineering judgment that's always uh, is prevalent to, to use. But understanding this, I think, is important, which we talk about also in our class. Well, there's three options and another topic to place the optical splitter. There's three places in the network that we can place an optical splitter. You can put it in the central officer node and serve all the homes or our units from that point. You can put it in a, in a cabinet, what's a fiber distribution hub or splitter cabinet, and serve hundreds of homes from that cabinet. Or you can carve out and put the splitter in each 32 home or 32 unit area. It's called distributed splitting. Distributed splitting has several options um, on how that is done. So there's there's actually more than three uh, there's three general places to put it. But you can see there's a number of different ways to configure distributed splitting, um, and I just kind of mentioned that. You can then from that and and run some cost for your particular situation based on your your labor rate, your take rate, the density of the areas that you're dealing with in your specific case and develops uh, charts based on the density, the take rate, 
and the distance from the hub or head in. Uh, and, and these charts can be broken out into different places to place the splitter, the different options for placing the splitter, like distributor, cabinets, or home run. And you can develop charts like this, and it's very easy to do. Uh, also, uh, I put this slide in here really just as a placeholder. Uh, this, this, it's very good to develop engineering practices uh, so that all the engineers in your group or organization, or if you, if you have them in different places, will be, we'll be designing using the same engineering guidelines. And uh, so it would be good to show and, and have steps on how to accomplish this. We talk about this a lot in our, in our course as well, actually how you go and design all three of these options and the steps that you go through. Um, in the distributed, I'll mention it for example, we have show techniques where you can take a single 24 fiber cable into a subdivision, say, and serve up to 256 homes. Or uh, in your rural area or some other areas, you can take 12 fibers and serve 352 homes for 12 fibers. And a lot of people say, well, there's no way you can do that. Well, there is the way that you can do it, uh, which we can develop that further. But it's very interesting to see that cost compared to other costs as well. And there's uh, there's uh, pluses and minuses. We are really trying to present all design options neutrally to show you all the advantages and disadvantages of all these options. And then you can make the right decision for your network. That's what this is all about. Um, and, and there's a, uh, one of the big decisions an engineer has to make because it involves a lot of different types of engineering is whether to connectorize uh, the drops go into the homes or fusion splice the drops. Uh, we go through several uh, of the, of the uh, uh, cases of that and uh, talk about the two main factors that, that, that really drive that decision is the labor rate and the density of the area that you're, you're dealing with. And we show how that applies to, to making that right decision and, uh, and how we can go on with, with that. Uh, so we need to really think about uh, the, the, uh, those two factors and then look at all of, the, all of the different advantages and disadvantages of uh, this decision because um, there's a lot of hype in, 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 out in the, in the vendor community, of course, because they're trying to sell all their products, and that's, not, that's okay. But we also need to look at all of the, the cost in, 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 in its entirety to really understand this, this option as well. Um, density has a high uh, impact on how you design fiber to the home networks, and there's a lot of different types of densities out there. Uh, one of them is trying to deal with high-rise buildings, and there's three problems with every high-rise building. That's first is how do you get into the building from the outside, and that can can really get inventive in some cases. The second issue is how do you extend from that point up the building uh, because some buildings may not have riser duct system in it. They may be old, um, so there's a number of different uh, problems that you encounter there. And then the third problem is once you get to the floor, how do you get to each unit from that location? Um, now, fortunately, there's a, a lot of really good solutions for all three of these, uh, but the, the engineer will have to take these, all the solutions, get their hands around and understand what's, what the solutions are and apply them where they, where they need to be applied in the most economical manner. And um, the, uh, the hardest thing may be getting into the building from the outside because that's, that's unless there may be conduit or going to that building from the outside, but it may be, it may be full already of, for of cables. So you may have to look at some other option, like going up and coming from the from the roof, or some other option as well. Um, you'll see uh, a lot of cases where there are uh, I'll call them high-rise buildings, but uh, um, uh, very dense areas where you have multiple units going down a road uh, of different different quantities. And how do you go about designing? That and, and this is also where take rate comes in. This is where density comes in, and we look at several different. There are several different solutions for this uh, as well. So we really need to understand that um, and get into that deeper in our in our course as well. 
and probably the most uh, prevalent uh, 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 density uh, as far as apartments is, is what you see on the slide here, where you have a single uh, owner that owns all these apartments in, 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 in this, area, in this uh, picture here. And they range anywhere from 6, 8, 12, 16, 20 units per building. And, they, uh, and they're configured in some pattern similar like this, although all of them are different. And then the, the, and generally, if you want to try to overbuild an apartment complex like this, it's very difficult because all the roads are there, the sidewalks are there, all the utilities are already there. Um, and so how do you go to try to economically configure a network if you were overbuilding, say, as an example, how do you go about doing that? And what's the most uh, economical design option? Remember, there's three places to put the splitter. Where should it go in this network? And uh, there are some advantages here because you can you're dealing with one owner that owns all the apartments. Uh, a lot, of, and because because of that, in some cases I've seen where uh, in the monthly rental rate, the the uh, cost for your your uh, service is already built into that rate. So you get 100% up front. Of course, there's dealings you have to have with the with the owner as well. So um, what what really becomes very important is the cost to put the facilities into the units like this. So uh, and there's a number of different ways to do that. Uh, one suggestion would be to go over instead of trying to follow the roads themselves. If you look, most apartment complex, you can be able to go around the outside. Behind the buildings, you'll see in this case where it's just pretty much vacant land around the outside of those buildings. And you can avoid crossing that road as much as possible. You can cut your costs way down. Uh, and we get, develop this further in, in our course as well in the, how to handle situations like this. Um, and then in, in the residential area as well, um, you can develop uh, uh, charts based on uh, the housing densities of the residential areas. Um, but what you'll see is that, that the costs are changing. And we particularly, uh, for example, the optical line terminal, uh, that's the, it has ports in that optical line terminal card. And each one of those ports is where you terminate the fiber going out to the, to the splitter, wherever the splitter is. Well, that's been a very high cost in the past. But what we have seen happen in the last couple of years is that cost of that optical line terminal going, uh, port, that card going way down. And the reason it's gone way down is the, in back uh, several years ago, you could only get a card with two, maybe four ports. Now you can get cards with 16 ports uh, from several different vendors. That has driven the cost way down. Well, that has a huge impact on where these are located uh, and, and, and he's, or where the splitter is located in the field because it is the optical line terminal cost or trying to optimize that cost that justifies, say, placing splitters in a fiber distribution hub or a splitter cabinet. So when those costs start changing, you must understand that and see where these costs are going and, and make the right engineering decision based on that. So that's what we want to really focus on and look at, in, in particularly in our course, is understanding these cost relationships and uh, what, in being able to, to to defend, so to speak, every mark you put on the drawing as an engineer. Um, so that's the things that, that we need to think about from from that perspective. When we look at single family subdivisions, when we drill down to the subdivision road itself. Uh, there's several different ways you can configure the network to serve uh, this type of sub this type of development. And uh, you, do you place cable on both sides of the road? Do you place cable on one side of the road and feed both sides of the road under the road? Uh, how do you go about configuring that? There's a lot of cost modeling that has been done uh, over the last 20 years on this particular item as well. And generally speaking, for fiber to the home purposes. Uh, it's been found that, that placing cable along the uh, one side of the road and feeding, say, four units on both sides of the road from a from a uh, drop closure is uh, uh, is is the most economical in the long run. 
uh, in HFC systems, hybrid fiber coax systems, typically in a lot of cases the cable companies were almost forced to place cable on both sides of the road because the cost of the because of the loss of the the drop going to the home with RG6 or whatever typically was very high, so they could not afford that to be a very long distance. So typically cable would be placed on both sides of the road. Well, that's not true here in the fiber to the home world where the fiber that is in a drop is the same as the fiber that's in the cable, the same loss and everything. So the parameters are different. And if the parameters are different, perhaps we have different solutions. So uh, that's what we've seen in, in fiber to the home, that, the, that there is a, a configuration that, that uh, for, for this type of arrangement that's, that's best. And then probably the most difficult uh, area to design is in a rural area. I was very fortunate that when I started my telephone telecommunications career back in the late 60s, uh, I started in a rural area. And I'm glad I did because when you're in a rural area, uh, there's not a lot out there. And so you have to really be creative with what you do with the facilities that are out there. Um, and I think that uh, that we particularly in in, uh, in the course that we we cover uh, uh, we talk about rural areas uh, um, and and look at all the different options because there's some very interesting ways to serve rural areas and over my career I think I I've, what I see in a rural area is three really different types of rural areas and I want to spend just a minute on that first uh, is a, an area that's got what I call clusters, whether it's uh, around a church or, or the county store or a post office or maybe a farmer with his family, his sons and daughters in houses around them. But you ride around, you'll see clusters of homes. Then you'll also find what I call sporadic uh, homes. Those are just randomly scattered. There's really no property lines out there in a rural area. Uh, so you'll find that. And then... The, then there's the sparse. That's the one home per mile in Texas at every oil well, if you will, that's really spread out. Um, and then there's the combination of all three of those. And the reason I bring that out is that we've got a lot of different design strategies out there. Uh, and so it would help us to understand when, we, when you look at your area, I think it would be a, a very, and we talk about this in the in the course a lot more. Uh, it would be a, to your benefit to look at the type of area you have got. Where are your clusters? Is it sparse, sporadic, the combinations? And then look at the design strategies that are available to see if you can, is, if there is a close match there. And I think in a lot of cases, you'll find that there is a way to match up some design strategies with what you have in the rural area to help drive the cost down. Uh, and that's the key. It's very expensive. It's, it's going to be very expensive anyway. So uh, if we can reduce the cost as much as possible, uh, that's what we want to do in the rural areas as well. So we talked about all the way from high rise to rural areas and all the different uh, options we have. And the main issues is where you would, in the rural areas, in any areas, where you place the splitter. Um, so, in another thing, we want another topic I want to cover with an with an engineer is you can come up with the best plan in the world, the the, the best design option, but you've got to be able to have the right products in place so that that design option lasts um, for the thirty or forty years that the fiber is going to last or more. So I would highly recommend that you develop a set of product specifications that will successfully implement the design strategy you want to do. Now, there's a lot of different kinds of fibers out there. There's a lot of different kinds of splitters out there. So you've got to make sure that what you, what you get will work and work uh, for, for the uh, design strategy you want to implement. For instance, and talk about optical splitters. You can get them one by two, the one by thirty-two, or two by thirty-two, uh, and you know various split ratios. But you should specify that you want a full spectrum splitter. 
because there are some splitters out there that will not pass all wavelengths equally uh, with an equal loss. So you've got to be careful with that. And with the, the technologies we see coming down the pipe, whether it's like WDM pond and all, you want to make sure that your fiber will be able to propagate all those wavelengths with uh, close to the same loss so that you don't run into future problems when you want to upgrade your network to eventually the WDM pond, which I think will be the, the final uh, thing, at least as far as I can see. Because it will allow us, the WDM pond will allow us to have a wavelength or two, eventually, to each unit with, tetra, with, with very high uh, bandwidth capability to the home, uh, far, far outseed anything that we have from a, from a bandwidth demand for single family at this point in time. So we've got to make sure that our products and our design strategy allows us to upgrade to wonderful technologies that's coming down the pipe and do it very seamlessly so we don't have to go rebuild the network, redo the network every time we want to upgrade. And, and we cover this in our course particularly, is that there's a way you can do that. And, and, and one rule that I've found over the years is that you do not want to manage or try to manage bandwidth in the field. It generally will not work because... Um, uh, there's two, because we have a mobile society and a high-end user may come into one area and you may do some special things in the field to provide them with, I don't know, 10 gigabits per home, to his home right now. Well, and he moves out in a year and grandma moves in and doesn't even have a computer. So you now you're going to have to chase and you're going to have to monitor and what you find out is that you wind up with a mess. But you also have the capability of managing that bandwidth on either end with the electronics. And we found over the years that that is the way we should try to engineer this network is so that we can manage the bandwidth using those electronics. And we'll have to change them out anyway to upgrade. So uh, being able to design this network so that we can do things like that, I think it helps us to... Uh, ease in the future in a much more uh, efficient manner. When we talk about things on another topic, uh, if you decide that uh, you want to place the optical splitters in a, in a cabinet or a fiber distribution hub, and that cabinet's going to serve hundreds of homes, two, three hundred homes, the, well, the question is how many homes should it serve? And, what, and how do you determine do I use a 32-home cabinet or do I use a 1,000-home cabinet in, or in between? Is there a way to determine that? And there is. That, that there's a lot of study and work that's been done on that. And we talk about that more in our class. And you have options like this where you have uh, many different uh, uh, homes that, and how you configure the network. Uh, and one of the things we do in our, in our class is to go through and actually do live examples uh, where the engineer or the students will actually do design work using all three of the design options to figure those out, or two of the three. Uh, generally, home run is not very difficult. So um, uh, we generally concentrate on the other two, FDH and distributed split, uh, since they are much more challenging to do than than, uh, than home run because that's simply just uh, counting the number of units and putting a, a fiber to each one. So uh, that's what we look at. But we have a situation like this where we need to understand how would I go about designing this in the most economical manner or subdivision like this. Um, there's And you will uh, be amazed at the difference in the cost. And I've seen a lot of studies uh, that compare, say, fiber distribution hubs of FTH, which the splitters in the cabinet to distributed splitting. But what you really need to do when you do that, and that's okay, is come up with the most economical design solution using each one of those design options. And and I've seen um, in, in, in presented in some conferences where where a, a presenter was trying to push one or the other more than the other one, and you could tell right off the bat that that uh, the, the, uh, one of the options was not given fair treatment. <laughs> so, uh, 
so uh, it's it's really important that we try to um, um, when we want to make those kind of studies that we do it in a in a in a fashion that will allow us to study uh, and, and and give each option its best shot. And when we get out in the rural areas, um, as I mentioned before, we we uh, this is one of the examples we do in our class. Uh, they actually design and look at the different ways to design it. Uh, and also, I might want to mention in our class that we ask uh, each student to bring in the class the areas that you want to design, and we start on those in class. Uh, of course, we will never won't get to finish them, but we'll get get you going on those to where you understand what you need to do, how you need to do it, and you can and you have a, a good shot at, at finishing those up. So. Uh, it's it's very important. You can see all the different densities. This this is another example of a, a rural area, but there's a lot of different uh, options in how you serve all of these densities. And for each uh, provider, you have your own specific dynamics: the labor rate that you have to deal with, the density you have to deal with, the take rate that you have to deal with. And understanding how to apply those three and do it smartly, I think, is, is and, and develop the right design option uh, with those three in mind is, is, uh, is key to being having a successful economical design. Well, I have uh, this uh, ends our, our presentation of uh, overview of the, uh, of the class and of these, uh, these two options in, in general. Uh, both the locations and the uh, of network elements in the field, and how you go about determining design strategy to use uh, to to uh, deploy those in the field economically. So we have time for some questions, um, and uh, Larry, if you want to uh, bring some up, uh, we'll see what we can do to to get an answer. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, yeah, thank you for the the wonderful presentation. Um, and I, I think that you're you're correct on uh, you know especially focusing on the the fact that each of the um, installations or designs that someone's taking a look at is is going to be unique and uh, there is no cookie cutter approach to all this and that's where uh, of course the more you do the better you get at this and um, you know the outline that uh, we try to strive for in the two days of classroom to cover all the options and different architectures and uh, topologies and uh, products, um, you know, is, uh, you know, making sure they're aware of the options. And then the, the, the third day of the class where basically we have the practices that we deliver and, and have people um, choose from and then come up to and justify why they chose that, uh, that architecture or topology. And then the the, cut, the review where they bring in their own charts and maps and desires and then the work with them. So, um, so it's a lot of fun and it really um, for us to present this. We have nine courses in the United States uh, this next year already scheduled, but uh, more so we're going to do a lot more custom courses internationally. Um, in review to the questions, so there's uh, one here. Um, and it's uh, can you please comment on the relative approximate cost of aerial traditional trenching and micro trenching techniques. Well, that's a very good question, and that's one of the decisions that an engineer has to make. Um, and obviously, uh, when I look at those three techniques, aerial, um, traditional trenching, and micro trenching, uh, the initial cost of aerial is uh, obviously more, uh, less expensive initially, but that's with a lot of uh, uh, say that kind of carefully because you could enter into problems with the aerial placement, particularly if you're going on existing pole lines with uh, somebody else owns the poles. You could get into a lot of make ready costs. And also, uh, a lot, a lot of times, your competition is not going to be speedy in fixing a place for you to get on their poles. <laughs> just, to, just from an obvious standpoint. So uh, there could be uh, problems with construction intervals as well. Um, and it almost it, that question almost begs to to look at what type of 
environment are you trenching in? And, and there's, when you look at the world, there's a lot of different trenching environments, whether it's micro-trenching or traditional open trench. Um, rock comes into play big time. And there's some places where uh, you can actually plow uh, instead of trenching. That uh, in, in sandy soil, uh, it's easy to do. In some cases down in, say, Louisiana, uh, they have problems with, with the... Uh, cable sinking because there's nothing to stop it from going, keep going down, down, down. So uh, I, I can't really give you a, a, a definitive yes or no. It's really going to depend on your particular situation, how, what your cost is, what your take rate is, what your business case will allow for cost, and then look to see uh, what makes the best sense for for your particular area you want to treat. How hard is it going to be if you want to go aerial? How hard is it going to be to get a, a, a location on the pole? Um, and if, you, if you're going underground, there may be an existing underground systems of ducks that you could lease from somebody. So that's another option instead of, of uh, building your own is, is to lease uh, conduit space from somebody else. Um, Micro-trenching has its uh, advantages in some cases. I, I think I, uh, most of the time I see it really uh, has benefits when you're in, a, say, a concrete jungle, when there's no dirt to be seen anywhere. Um, but uh, it, is very, it, it still is very expensive. So uh, it really takes, uh, uh, what it takes is to look at your particular area to look at your cost that your business case will allow, and then uh, take those two things and then come up with the best solution. Everybody would love to have, I think, ideally love to have your own cable and your own conduit underground protected, uh, but there's a, high, there's a cost for doing that. So I can't really give you a, a do this, that, or that, but take a look at your area, take a look at your business case, and see how you can blend those uh, those two together into a viable solution that lets your business case work, lets you deploy the facilities that you need where you need it in a cost-efficient manner. A um, couple other questions here, David. I'll try to get through them all. Um, and for those, that, in case we're not able to get them all covered, we will respond uh, electronically to everybody with their questions. Uh, one of these is, how do I get the training courses to South Africa? We have a growing FTTH council and community and, um, and want to know how to do this. Actually, um, you can, we can uh, contact you electronically for this, but we are doing courses right now in the Asia-Pacific region, but we have instructors uh, worldwide, and w but most of the time we'll, we'll send our m subject matter experts, such as David, um, to where the class is. So uh, we'll go through the process of just sending a custom course questionnaire uh, to you. Uh, thanks, Nile, for that. Um, another question um, was, um, do you have a 5, 10, or 20-year forecasting fiber feeder and distribution tool for city, urban, and rural areas? Can you take that, um, David? Uh, let me make sure I understood. It was a 5, 10, or 20-year tool for forecasting fiber requirements? Well, it's fiber feeder and distribution tool, so I, I'm not sure if that's going to be covering uh, spare fiber counts. And, of course, we also have the topic of transitioning from legacy pawn uh, systems to 10G pawn systems to WDM. It sounds like he's wanting to know, is there a tool that you can put in the, the demand and it would generate a number of fibers um, for, for both feeder and distribution? Uh, that can be easily developed. Uh, we, we don't, uh, Light Brigade doesn't at the present time sell tools like that, but it's a it's a it's an easy thing to do on on a on a Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and 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 during our course that we teach, we could uh, um, and I've done this before is help um, um, the students develop tools like that. That's that's. Uh, uh, it, you really need to first decide where your optical splitter is going to go. What's the most economical location for that? 
Is it in the FDH environment, a splitter cabinet? Are you going to distribute the splitter in each 32 home area, or are you going to home run it? Because that will determine the fiber demand is the splitter location. Because you know, on the CO side, the splitter is one, say. On the field side, is 32 fibers. So that location has to be determined before you can you can um, you can develop any kind of forecast. But once you do that, then yes, there's ways to take numbers of units. Um, and I've done this before for 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 customers, as a rat, and back when I was uh, before my light brigade days, uh, when I was actually helping customers and doing design work with and for them, um, taking um, uh, actually whole towns and taking feeder routes and start at the end of it and accumulating the number of units, knowing where the splitter is go, goes, then you can, you can determine distribution cable size and you can determine feeder cable size. Now, there's another option you have on the feeder cable size. Not every company places the amount of feeder that you will want to have for the next 40 years. Generally, they will size it for 10, 15 years or something like that, uh, somewhere in that. But that means that you need to make sure that you have infrastructure to support a second, third, fourth cable along the main feeder routes. And the branch feeder routes, uh, those are generally short in most companies. A lot of cases what I'm seeing is, is those are ultimately sized, and there's a way to do that, ultimately size it. And when you're, and if you're, and, and that would feed, say, either fiber distribution hubs or distributive splits out in the field, out in the in each 32 home pond area, then you can determine um, where those splitters are going. Then in drawing circles around X number of homes, if you're doing FDH uh, deployment, so you can pretty much determine your your distribution cable size. Generally, you would want to provide for the ultimate number of homes or number of fiber requirements there as well. So there, we can develop spreadsheets that's very simple to do, to um, to do that. And um, I don't know if I fully answered it, but but the first thing is determine what your strategy is going to be and then look at the um, uh, some engineering guideline decisions need to be made of how, 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 how many years you want your feeder to last before you need to... Uh, uh, reinforce it with more more fiber. Okay, uh, another uh, question was um, for fiber to the building installations. Are there different? Um, you, you mentioned home run and distributed and centralized. Uh, can you use these in FTTB installations as well? Uh, it, absolutely. Uh, and again, it, whether it's fiber to the building. One of the determination, one of the things that determine the most economical uh, design uh, strategy would be what is the take rate that you're encountering, and uh, that take rate will determine the splitter location. For example, let's say you were serving a building that's 100% take rate. Just go go wild here. If what our modeling, my modeling has done over the years has told me that the higher the take rate, the closer you want to move that splitter to the homes or to the units you're going to serve. Why? Because on the CO side of the splitter is one fiber, on the field side is 32 fibers if you're using a 1 by 32. So it makes sense that if I have a 100% take rate, I want to get that splitter as close to those units as I can to minimize the 32 side and maximize the one side. That's just from an economic standpoint. So uh, so the decision to be made on the fiber to the building has to go back to what is my take rate, what is my anticipated take rate, and where is the most economical location to place the splitter based on that take rate. So that's the, that's the uh, approach that I would recommend taking. And, uh, and all three options will obviously work for fiber to the FETB. They'll work for any of, the, any of the options. So you have to take it a step further and look at what's the take rate 
and then run, run the economics, run the modeling to see where that splitter should be located. Okay, David, uh, another, another question here was, could you tell us something about deployments in um, industrial areas? Um, I guess we're talking about industrial zones. Uh, a lot of towns will go and have an industrial park, if you will. I, I guess we, we can, if, if that's, that's where you kind of wanted to take the question. And generally speaking, those types of requirements, I think, are, are a bit beyond um, a, a, a single-family residential or small business. We're into a bigger industry area that the demand for, for, the, for bandwidth in a bigger industry area is probably is greater. The need for them to have maybe a diverse path back to the node or central office serving it uh, could be greater. So that means that you would want, and they would probably, my guess is that they would, uh, we're talking about bigger industries here in industrial park industries, um, manufacturing plants, um, even data centers and um, those kinds of things. Uh, their, their communication needs is different than the other 95 or 98 percent of the world outside of an industrial park. So that probably would lend itself more to an active Ethernet type of solution, a dedicated bandwidth, rather than PON, which is a passive and you're sharing the bandwidth with many industries or many, or many um, customers. So uh, that goes back, and it's a good question, it goes back to originally what we, we talked about at first, and and that's taking a look at um, designing your network, doing a fundamental plan for an area, and designing a pond network for single family, for residential areas, uh, and small business, mom and top small business. But take a look at these industrial parks. And you may be, say, in the southeast quadrant of your town, and develop a fundamental plan for that entire town, but figure out a way in which we cover uh, show you how to do that in our course, how to overlay on top of the PON plan for the 90 plus percent of the regular customers and how to overlay a, an Ethernet solution for those industrial areas. And, um, and you dedicate uh, buffer tubes to it if you want to, so, and, uh, uh, and build it when you need it. You don't have to build it day one, but have it planned that way. Okay, a couple more questions before we time out here. One is a real easy one. I took uh, the EPA one, two, three course as a pre. Is it a prerequisite, or is there a prerequisite for this course? And I'll take this one, Dave. Um, in, in this case, while we would love everybody to take the Certified Fiber to the Home Professional course with a certification, whether it's online or in a classroom, uh, this class also stands on its own, uh, and there's a beginning uh, chapters cover in for the basics upon architectures, terminologies, uh, protocols, et cetera. So uh, while we'd love to have you take uh, one of the other courses beforehand, there is not a prerequisite for this course that would, would be covered. Um, another question here, Dave. Uh, the question is, is, does this content cover fiber to the cell site? Uh, we have a, a designer here is look uh, that's working and getting ready to deploy dark fiber to sell sites a, a, at a location. Can you um, address this? Um, it doesn't specifically cover fiber to the cell site, um, but then it does in general. Um, that is a fiber requirement. A fiber to the cell site is a fiber requirement to a in a feeder route which would include businesses and residential. Cell site is another fiber requirement. And remember up, up front we said we need to get our hands around all of the requirements of, uh, in a feeder route. Once we have that feeder route determined with the boundaries, we need to get our hands around all the requirements. Now, there's two ways to look at cell sites. One is is point to point, or and another is in a ring configuration. And so, uh, and he didn't say which way, which one he was talking about. But we can 
talk about both of them, uh, where it's point to point, then it's that's just another requirement for fiber in the network. So you just add that to your to your list, but be able to identify the needs and where those cell sites are is is very critical in your in your in your engineering of that network uh, feeder route. Now, if it's a ring configuration, uh, you could go back to what I uh, had mentioned before in laying out a fundamental plan for an entire town. Uh, and if you if your cell sites wants to be configured in a ring configuration, you can do that simply by overlaying that need on top of the feeder routes you designed for the for the single family uh, and residential and small business fundamental plan. And we get into that in, in more depth. But you can use that same thought pattern that I'm, I mentioned with the active Ethernet going to the industrial. You can use that same thought process for cell sites. Uh, service if they want it in a reconfiguration as well. So we do cover it, but we don't cover it um, in, 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 any, in any detail. It's just another fiber requirement uh, in, a, in a route. Okay, thanks, David. Um, and uh, again, for those uh, questions that we were unable to answer in the time frame allotted, we will be getting back to you individually and uh, address your questions. Uh, we, we thank you very much for attending. Uh, next uh, month, uh, we have our testing and troubleshooting FTTH systems, and uh, we're going to continue doing these uh, monthly presentations uh, on topics of interest, and of course, with Love to hear with you, hear from you on topics or that you may want to um, cover with us, and that. So uh, I'm going to hand this back over. Um, okay, uh, I thought I was going to hand it over, and I'm not. So everyone, wish you a great time. Thank you, and uh, we'll see you next month.